Who am I? I'm a time traveler from the year 2060. My name is Rowan Elders, but that isn't important. The only thing you really need to know about me is that I have your best interest at heart. An FAQ. Why are you posting this here? There are a massive amount of places that I can post this on the internet, but very few of those places would actually read the entire thing, even though you won't think that I'm serious. If you need to think this is some twisted entertainment in order to absorb the information, then I hope you're entertained. What caused the apocalypse? I have no idea. There's no internet to look it up, no books to read about it, no way to really find any information on the topic. The only reason that I really know it happened in 2040 is because my parents had told me about it. How did you get to the year 2022? I have no idea what sent me here or why I'm here, or if I can change anything, but I might as well do my best, right? If you don't know how to time travel or what caused the apocalypse, why am I even reading this? Did you even look at the title? This isn't about stopping the apocalypse. It's about helping as many people survive it as possible. And with that out of the way, let me start to tell you, for lack of a better phrase, what the apocalypse is and some tips on how to survive it. Now what is the apocalypse? I don't know what caused it, but I do know that it wasn't nuclear. Something just happened. As far as I'm aware, it affected people at random. The really lucky ones died instantly. Some, according to my dad it was around 10%, were completely unaffected. And the rest were turned into mindless monsters. If you want to survive, follow these 11 rules. 1. If you see an otherworldly light in the distance while traveling at night, ignore it at all cost. They're just trying to lure you in. 2. Don't go into the forest or the ocean. That's where the worst things live. 3. If you hear something screaming the words, Hey, help me. Close your eyes, shut your mouth, and stand as still as possible. Even if you're currently running away from something, what the callers will do to you is infinitely worse than anything you can imagine. 4. If the stars go out, get cover immediately. 5. If you see a blue translucent triangle hovering a foot above the ground, step into it. We don't know where they lead, but it has to be better than here. 6. Don't drink any cans labeled Paraquand. They didn't exist before all of this had happened, and there's no way of telling what exactly will happen to you, but I can guarantee that it won't be good. 7. Don't eat the meat of any of the monsters you kill. Nothing might happen the first time that you do it, but eventually you won't be able to stop. 8. When you're dreaming, if you see a man wearing a suit and tie trying to give you things for free, or some undisclosed amount, don't take any of it. You can't pay him back. 9. If you find a doorway that's completely unconnected to any other structure, don't go through. I have absolutely no idea what's on the other side, but I have heard the screaming that comes from it. 10. Do not pray. The angels aren't here to help you. Don't try to get their attention. The same goes for demons. 11. In the event that you find yourself being followed by an exact copy of yourself, ignore it for as long as possible. It's lying to you, and no matter what it says, it can't help you. I have transcribed several entries from the notebook I used to document monstrosities below. Please note that the examples I chose are not the most dangerous, but rather the most common. Name, Carpal. Appearance. It looks to be a ball of pale, outstretched arms, with a mouth on each end. The center of the being is some kind of gooey black mass. Behavior. Whenever any human comes within 10 yards of it, 
it will open the mouths on its hands and release a high-pitched scream, capable of shattering the eardrums of anyone too close. How to kill. The gooey center mass seems to be extremely flammable, and while igniting it will cause it to begin screaming. Any damage that it would cause can be avoided with earplugs. Sometimes these can be useful to distract other things. Name, the beggar. Appearance, extremely similar to a blobfish, but roughly six feet tall on average. Behavior, the beggar will do exactly as its name suggests. It begs for death. If you get close enough to try and dispatch it with a knife, a tentacle will emerge from its mouth, wrapping around the torso of whoever comes near it, pulling them into the mouth filled with thousands of razor-sharp rotating teeth. How to kill. There has not been a method found to consistently dispatch the beggar. Bullets seem to do nothing, and fire just makes it bag louder. Avoid if possible. Name. Cruors. Appearance. A ten foot tall humanoid, very malnourished, completely covered in thick black scales, save for its giant white eyes, and a mouth permanently curled into a giant smile. Behavior. It seems not hostile. It simply watches from a distance, never moving closer or farther away. I once knew a guy who tried to chase one down and catch it. I found his body several days later, his eyes ripped out. When I asked him if he was alright, he just screamed and gibbered about his blood being poisoned. He put himself down a few minutes later. How to kill. Just avoid. It doesn't seem to be worth the ammo. This is the best that I can do for now, but I will find time to post more guides in the future. Stay safe out there. Hi everyone, while they believe the first entry in this guide works well to give you a vague idea of what not to do if and when you find yourself in this horrible world, but I would ideally like to expand on each rule, to tell what I know about it, what you should do if you break that rule and possibly tell the story about it too. The Rule 2a Don't go into the forest. If you break the rule, just don't. There's no reason to do so, but if you do, then you run the gambit of being eaten by predators like wood bears and dakes, or never leaving. Why you shouldn't enter the forest? From what I've seen of your time, most forests seem to be relatively harmless, in some cases even entirely safe. But after the year 2040, this is not the case. Forests have become something similar to an ocean. The trees on the edge are still a normal size, but the farther you go in, the larger they get, and the worse you'll find. While I've never been dumb enough to enter a forest, I have been told stories of what lies within. Something that looks like it used to be a bear, completely devoid of fur, roughly the size of a house, and carnivorous beasts that look like the forgotten children of deer and snakes, and a strange pale humanoid creature with a long neck, a creepy smile, and spindly limbs. It's worth noting that I've only ever seen the last one. The first two I've heard about from an acquaintance that managed to enter the forest and survive. He said that if you manage to go deep enough, you will find things that can't exist. And while I had considered listing out what exactly he told me, I thought that it may be more interesting to simply transcribe one of his stories. Please bear in mind that I haven't spoken to him in years, and even when I did know him, he wasn't all there mentally. Jay's story. I don't know why I did it. It could have been curiosity or a desire to learn what lies beyond the shadow cast by a canopy of countless trees. Or heck, even boredom, but for whatever reason, I didn't stop after a few steps this time. You already know about the dakes and the wood bears, but I found so much worse in the depths of that forest. When I noticed the first one, I thought that I was just seeing things. At a glance, it looked like any other tree, but the longer I looked at it, the weirder it became. 
It was just a few shades too light to be tree bark, and it made a constant, quiet, low groaning sound, and the thing was sticky to the touch. I just felt uncomfortable being around it, and so I moved on. Every now and then, I would find another, but I just considered it a surprisingly benign addition to this awful world. After hours of hiding and carefully making my way through the forest, I found something even stranger. A house. And I don't mean no new house. That someone had made in the forest. I mean a house that was made with old construction methods from before the world went to crap. The entire thing was falling apart. The roof was half caved in, the door was jammed, and almost all of the windows were smashed. But these cellar doors were perfectly preserved. More than that, actually, they were like new. No damage, no rust, nothing. When I opened them, they didn't even squeak. Now, of course, there weren't any lights and I didn't have a flashlight, but I did have my lighter. I made my way down into it, and the stairs were perfect too. They didn't creak like an old house would, and they weren't damaged. Not even so much as scratched. But that was just the beginning. When I got to the bottom, there was a large room, lined with shelves containing a variety of, um, questionable articles. On the right side, there was a jar full of murky liquid containing what looked to be the head of a human on a metal spider-like body, an axe covered in a blackish-red substance, and the remains of a gigantic spider-like thing with two sets of legs, a bottle of sriracha glued to the shelf, and filled with some kind of black liquid that seemed to move on its own, desperately trying to escape. On the left side, there was a human skull that had the word Dave written on it, with what I hope was red ink and a book titled, What the heck did I just read? But the really strange thing was the statue carved into the wall. Well, I call it a statue, but it was more of a shrine. The figure carved into the wall was almost humanoid. Almost. Its head was covered in eyes and tentacles. Two wings were outstretched behind it, and it was rising up from what looked to be a body of water. I would have taken time to draw the thing, but just then, I heard a loud stompy footsteps coming from the ceiling. That scared me so bad that I dropped my lighter onto the floor and noticed that it was covered in dried blood. I didn't stop to see whatever put the blood there or to pick up the lighter. I just took off out of the basement. Now, any smart person would have stopped and left the woods, but as you unfortunately know, I am not smart. These strange trees that I mentioned before kept getting more and more common. I went from finding one every couple of hours to every few minutes, to always having at least 10 around me at a time. At some point when I hid behind one to avoid a horde of digs, I finally figured out what was so strange about them. It was covered in skin, pale clammy human skin. The more that I pressed my hands into it, the more they sank in. I pressed my hand into it, down to my wrist for a uh, science. I was barely able to pull myself out, and when I did, the skin on the tree had stretched out, the imprint of a face straining against the skin, as if it were trying to escape the tree. Help me. The voice was raspy and garbled like the voice was coming from underwater. And then suddenly the tree was covered in outlines of faces and arms, as at least a dozen different people called out, either screaming or rasping, but all begging for help. That was the last straw. I took off back where I came from, not bothering to be stealthy or careful, just trying to get out of there as soon as possible. Every skin tree I passed was covered in the outlines of people calling out, except for one. I hadn't noticed it when I had first passed. I was too distracted. But the tree next to the old house was covered in bodies, in various states of decay, each stuck to the tree upside down, with a massive cut on their throat. Like whoever had put them there had drained all of their blood out of them first. 
I took the only look back of my entire run as I passed the house, seeing someone or something standing on the second floor where the roof looked like it had been caved in. I couldn't really make out their features. All I could see were two eyes that looked slightly too large to be human and a massive grin. End of Jay's story. Please do not go into the forest. While Jay is the only person that's ever told me about what can be found in the deepest parts, I've heard countless stories about people deciding to go exploring and never coming back. And I don't take how easily he managed to traverse it as an indicator of how it actually is. As I intentionally left out methods he explained for avoiding bears and dakes, just to ensure that none of you would go in and explore it if given the chance. Other questions from my last post. Please note that some have been paraphrased for sake of brevity. If I skipped over an important aspect of your question, or there is some kind of other issue, feel free to leave a comment below, and I will either fix it or address it in the next part. Why not post everywhere and closer to the actual apocalypse? Well, for the first part of that question, please see the why are you posting this here section on my prior post. For the second part, because I would assume that putting something on the internet and giving it 10 years to spread is probably better than giving it a few months or even days. But feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Is this satire? Please see the why are you posting this here section of my prior post. How do you have such a good grammar? If you live in the year 2060 in a post-apocalypse, I would assume most of the books have been destroyed. That's a fair assumption, but it's wrong. I've read plenty of books and have had a fair amount of practice writing since. I've kept at least one journal with me since I was 15. Why shouldn't we pray to the angels and who even are they? I don't know who they are exactly or even if they are angels. What I know about them is I've learned mostly through secondhand stories or rumors. But most sources say that prayer can draw them to you. I have actually seen someone pray once, knowing what was coming, and I left him to his own devices. Three hours later, I came back, and I found a skeleton stripped bare of all flesh. Did your parents travel with you to our time? No, they passed away about five years before I traveled here. I thought it might have been longer. My parents were the ones that usually kept track of the year. To celebrate Christmas and my birthday, and after they passed, I stopped keeping track of time. Now that I've touched on the forest, it's probably a good time to talk about what the oceans will look like in the future. I've seen images of what lies in the depths of your oceans today. Eyeless monsters that have a taste for blood. Creatures with bioluminescence that they use to lure things into their gaping maw. And all manner of giant monsters, but it gets so much worse in the future. Of course, I've never seen the depths of the ocean, or what lies within in the future, but I have seen what lives in the shallows, and things that have ended up on the beach. What lives in the shallows? The shore trap. I've never seen the full body of this monster, but I have on several occasions witnessed horrible black jaws rise from the water, full of needlepoint teeth, only to grab someone or something and drag them into the shallow wet sand, kicking and screaming. The tongue. Occasionally, while near the beach, we'll hear random bubbling, like tongue sounds, and later, near where you've heard those sounds, you may find a ball of glass or a chunk of burnt meat. There are small, crustacean-like creatures that live in the sand, just like the shore trap. As far as I can tell, they seem to have some kind of relation to the peacock mantis shrimp which exists today. I mostly guess this, as they can snap their claws or cause a chemical reaction hot enough to melt glass and cook meat instantly. The major difference between these is that the shrimp that I have mentioned previously is their size and coloration. Tongues are usually around a foot long, with the largest I've ever seen growing to be about three feet long, and they're usually a yellowish beige color, the exact coloration of sand. Please note that these are not all the creatures that live in the shallows. Just a couple that should help you extrapolate these sort of things that live there. 
what I have found washed up on the beach. Water people. Now I know it's not a very good name, but I didn't come up with it. Every so often, I'll find the body of something that looks a lot like a person washed up on the beach, but with a few key differences. Their hands and feet are webbed, and they have gray, smooth skin, blank yellow glowing eyes, and a mouth full of rows of serrated triangular teeth. I once found one that was still alive, missing an arm, and bleeding a disgusting smelling greenish red blood. When I tried to talk to it and help it out, it lunged for me, trying to sink its teeth into my leg. I think it's safe to say that these are likely hostile and should be avoided. A tassel, a large 20 to 30 foot long snake like monster with a long slender body, six heads full of razor sharp teeth and 12 tails ending in large fins. Now I can only describe what this one looks like based on two separate bodies that I found, and as such may actually look somewhat different from how I describe it here. The first body that I had found had large chunks taken out of it, as if it had been eaten by a school of smaller creatures, and the second one was half eaten, its head and neck still attached by little more than a thick strip of flesh. The bite mark on the creature looked smooth and uniform as if something far larger than it had been trying to eat it in a single bite. I don't know. I refuse to give this one an actual name, as I dearly hope that it is merely an isolated instance and not something that exists commonly in the oceans. I only found the decayed remnants of a head, but it was 30 feet long to be specific, 31 feet and 7 inches. I measured it. It looked crocodilian with round cone-like teeth. That's all the details that I have on it. I have never seen what it looks like as a whole, and I never want to, and I especially never want to see whatever had killed it. And just so you're aware, I typically don't list out every single monstrosity or creature that I know of, but in this case, I have listed out every single monstrosity that I've ever found washed up on the beach. Why the ocean can be useful. Now, despite everything that I've just typed, there are still reasons to stay near the beach. Other living creatures like dakes and kuruxes will avoid going anywhere near it. Fishing can be useful for finding food, and if you can manage it, then potable water can be made from seawater. Tips for fishing. Don't eat anything that looks like an abomination. It probably is and eating them can cause issues. Don't eat fish with human eyes either. If something rips the fishing rod out of your hand, do not go in after it. Make sure to stay out of the water while fishing. If you see two light orange lights right next to each other watching you, those are eyes. You're done for the day. Leave immediately. Aside from that, it's common sense and logic apply. Other Look up elsewhere how to make a seawater purifier. It's fairly easy given that you have the right tools. Mine, for example, was a metal pan with a lid that had a hole in the top, combined with a pipe that let boiled water rise up and then pass into a separate container. And good luck to all of you. If you have any questions about what was written here, feel free to leave a comment below and if I can, I'll answer it. And if there are a lot of them, then I'll answer them at the end of my next guide. Now, let's get into rule number 8 and the man involved with it. The man in question is typically described as wearing a suit and tie with an average build and a normal face, hair that ranges between black blonde and every color in between, and dark brown almost black eyes. He never goes by any one name consistently, but my father always called him Morpheus. If you encounter him in your dream, two things will occur instantaneously. First, you will realize that you're dreaming, and second, the location of your dream will instantly shift, no longer be an abstract, and instead taking place somewhere pleasant that no longer exists, like a bar or a restaurant, and even in some cases your child at home. He will try to offer you whatever you want most of the time, things like specific foods, houses, weapons, and so on, you must not accept. 
Whatever he offers you will be tempting, but there is always a price, and that price usually involves blood. Below is a story that I pieced together based on my father's journal and conversations that I've had with him and others. Near what is currently the state of Florida, I met a man who accepted such an offer. Stephen Hall was over 60 years old and he had been having the same dream every day for the last week. He would always step into a bar with the knowledge that he was dreaming. Every time he would walk and sit down in front of the bartender and order three shots of vodka and down each one. By the time that he had finished the third, a man would always appear and say, Wow, that was impressive. Let me buy you a few more. Hours would go by with the two of them chatting and drinking until the man would stop, look at his watch and ask, I've got an offer for you. How about I give you? Each dream he offered something different. It started with five bottles of whiskey and then grew to be a new ring for his wife for their up and coming anniversary. Each offer was more luxurious than the last. But Stephen had managed to survive 40 years in this horrible apocalyptic world, and knowing that nothing was ever free, he always gave the same answer. No thanks, I have everything that I could want. And he continued to give the answer until uh, his wife got sick. Madeline Hall had contracted a horrible illness out of nowhere, and the two were careful. They always boiled their water before drinking it, made sure to cook their food thoroughly, and avoided other people as much as they could. But despite all of that, Helen became deathly ill. Stephen did what he could to take care of her, nursing her fever, asking people that he knew, like my father, if he had anything that could help, and searching the abandoned cities for any kind of medicine. Unfortunately, he failed on every account, and when he got back from searching, his wife was practically gone. The only thing that he could do was make her as comfortable as possible and stay with her until the end. That night, he had one more dream about Morpheus, this time offering him medicine that was capable of saving his wife. What's the catch? Stephen asked, staring at the little orange bottle full of bright red pills. Catch? There is no catch, Mr. Hall. I only want you to do one thing for me. Then you can wake up and move poor suffering Helen away from that precipice that she's standing on. Morpheus lifted his glass, finishing his third Bloody Mary. The sign he usually gave Stephen to tell him that the dream was almost over. What do I need to do? He asked, struggling to keep himself calm. I'm afraid that I can't tell you that, however. I can assure you that what I'm asking will not involve harming your wife in any way, shape, or form. As I mentioned earlier, Stephen was a smart guy, and he knew that this deal would probably get him killed. But he didn't care. He loved his wife more than anything else, and as far as he was concerned, the world could burn if it meant that she would be okay. The two shook hands and Stephen woke up, the knowledge of what he needed to do firmly resting in his mind. He reached into his pockets and pulled out an orange pill bottle, a single big red gel capsule sitting inside. Stephen managed to get the pill down her throat, left several gallons of water for her to drink, and to note explaining what had happened. My father, curious to know how his friends were doing, left my mother and me to check it out. He found the note in the halls of makeshift shelter, and a set of wet, oily footprints trailing off from Helen's bed. He followed them for as long as possible. Every 10 steps or so, the footprints shifted a little bit, becoming less and less human, until they had reached a river. At this point, they stopped entirely, with no sign that anything had ever left the water. My father either had no idea what exactly happened to Stephen, or chose not to write it down. But either way, days later, he found what was left of him. All of the skin had been peeled off of his legs and arms and both of his feet, and his left hand was missing. Massive bites were taken out of his skinless parts of flesh, with large, malformed footprints walking towards the body and away from it. The thing my father always told me was strange was that Helen didn't have the normal flu-like symptoms, 
but instead reacted like she was poisoned. When he had brought this up to Stephen while he was looking for help, he had dismissed it, stating that they always ate and drank the same thing, so the only way she could have been poisoned was if someone had managed to do it while they were asleep, without waking either of them up, and that was impossible, since they were both such light sleepers. If you ever see a man in your dreams that's offering you things without telling you what you need to do in return, do not accept. What he gives you is unlikely to help, and the cost is more than you may first think. Warning, if you ever drink a can of Paraquant and find that you haven't instantly died, throw up immediately. Description, standard energy drink can, roughly 8.5 inches tall, with a diameter of around 3 inches. Lacking any kind of nutritional info on the side, bright orange with the word Paraquant, spelled exactly as written on the side, at a 45 degree angle in golden letters. I've heard rumors about its origins. Some say that it washed up on the beaches, completely dry despite having just been in the ocean. Others say that it just appeared on store shelves after everything went to crap. And others still have said that it appeared in their packs when they were most desperate for a drink. Generally, only a few things happen to those that drink Paraquant. The most common being instant death, with no obvious injuries or issues, like the person's heart just stopped beating. An unlucky few suffer hallucinations for the rest of their usually short lives, seeing things like giant octopus man hybrids hanging in the air, or massive gelatinous balls of tentacles and eyes. Even worse, a handful of people land in the Walter category. He was one of the first stories that spread about these strange new cans popping up everywhere. He drank his can of Paraquant without any prior knowledge of the effects that it could have. He had found it in the refrigerator of an aging house that he had been scavenging for food, and immediately assumed that it was just a normal energy drink that he had never heard of. So, without giving it a second thought, Walter downed the entire can in one long pole. It's worth noting that those who normally find themselves feeling Walter effects won't have anything immediately happen to them. Walter had finished off the can, tossed it to the ground, and continued sweeping houses looking for food. It wasn't until three hours later that he noticed a green growth had appeared on his wrist. Without giving it a second thought, Walter reached out and ripped off the strange growth. As he did so, pain exploded from his wrist, blood gushed out of his now open wound, and a closer look at the thing that he had just torn out of his hand revealed a tiny translucent pink root, or tentacle-like tendrils, hanging from the end that had just been connected to him. As fast as he could, Walter bandaged his new wound and took off not wanting to be there for very long when something caught the scent of his blood. Hours later, when he had finally finished scavenging, he set up camp at an old used car dealership. Walter found the most comfortable car that he could to sleep in for the night. But before he could even lay down, he noticed another bulbous growth, this time on his left wrist. Walter was presented with a choice. Rip out the new growth and risk of bleeding out in his sleep or leave the growth and hope that it doesn't do any strange while he sleeps. Unfortunately, he chose the latter. When Walter woke up, he was no longer in the car that he had fallen asleep in. He was now laying about a hundred feet away, face down in the dirt, with his entire arm up to his shoulder and buried in the ground. He struggled to unearth his hand, almost as if something in the ground had caught hold of him and refused to let go. Different versions of the story specify different amounts of time for him being stuck unearthing his arm, but I remember it being generally agreed that he took over an hour to get his hand free. When he finally finished digging up his arm, he was terrified at what he found. The flash from his fingers to his elbow had changed, the area from his wrist to elbow becoming waxy, like the outer layer of a stem, his fingers elongating and taking on a rough texture, like roots, the entire thing now green and covered in thin, stringy vines. Walter understandably freaked out, 
For the next week, he told anyone that he could find of his plight, and he begged for help. But nobody knew how to help him. And that entire week, the plant-like growth spread more and more. On the first morning, his entire left arm from wrist to shoulder was completely covered in vines. On the third, his right arm was covered. On the fifth day, two more marks had sprouted, one on each kneecap. And by the seventh, his feet were rooted to the ground, making him completely incapable of moving his arms or legs. After that, the process slowed dramatically. Every monster or beast or other kinds of abominations that otherwise would have devoured him on the spot ignored him, leaving him to his fate. Every day, the growth on his knees moved upward, and almost a year after it had started, the vines poured into his mouth, flowing down his throat and removing his ability to speak. This is another part of this story where I've heard two different versions. In the first, the vines poured into Walter's shut eyes, covering the rest of his head. He had long since perished from asphyxiation or starvation, or any number of other issues that would have arisen from his situation. The only reminder that he ever existed being a cautionary tale, and a vaguely human-shaped bush. And though I feel that the second version is far more likely to be true, I would urge you to believe in the first. If for no other reason, then it is at least slightly more optimistic. In the second version, Walter was still alive and conscious. The plants had supplied him with everything that he needed, from oxygen to nutrients. When they finally dug into his still open and fearful eyes, the only sound that he had made in weeks was heard. A muffled scream, and garbled words that vaguely sounded like, Please, please kill me. It's that that occasionally, muffled screams can still be heard from the plant that used to be Walter. I've never witnessed it personally, but I wouldn't doubt it. There are other stories of what's happened to those that have consumed a paraquand. A friend of mine once had a cannon turned into what I can only describe as a monster. But I'll have to tell that story another time. I wanted to circle back and share another story or two about the force of this world. Please note again that below, the story is not my own and it has been transcribed from a journal of my possession. As usual with these transcriptions, I have tried to edit it to make it as coherent as possible. The first entry in journal. I've decided to go back into the forest. Everyone I've spoken to has agreed that doing so would be incredibly stupid, and that I only survived the first time out of pure luck, but I'm not convinced. There's a lot to learn from it. And besides, I'm the only one that's managed to find ways to avoid the wood bears and the dakes. The only one that can actually document what's in there for the good of humanity, or at least what's left of it. Second entry. I took a few weeks to gather supplies for my trip. With a lot of work and Rowan's help, I managed to scrape together almost a month's worth of rations and water. And the only thing that he asked for was a copy of my journal. I offered to let him come with me so that I could teach him how to get past the various monstrosities that live within. But he just shook his head and said that the copy of my journal would do enough. The third entry. I have just entered the forest. The scent of the air is different from the other times. Usually, it's a combination of metal and petrichor. But today, the only thing I can smell is rot and decay. Fourth entry. I found the source of the stench. One of these skin trees was ripped to shreds. Massive chunks of flesh and bones are littering the ground and leading away from it. There are a set of tracks completely unlike what I've seen in the forest before. They were almost human. But whatever it was had been moving on all fours. And not only were the fingers and toes too long, but the tracks were also too far apart. Upon seeing the tracks, I was considering going back, but I barely started and if I do, all of the work we put into gathering these supplies will have gone to waste. Fifth entry. I'm being followed. I don't know by who or what, but there is definitely something tailing me. At some point while I was walking, I realized that my journal had fallen out of my pack. Now wanting to forfeit all of the entries that I'd made up to this point, 
and the possibility of future entries. I turned and went back in a giant circle until I found my own tracks. And to my surprise, there were another set of tracks moving down the same path as me. The same ones that I found earlier leading away from the skin tree. I followed them for a while and eventually I found my notebook several feet off the ground stuck in a tree. Whatever put it there left it mostly untouched. Except above this entry, there is a small section that had strange symbols drawn into it. Symbols that I'm not familiar with. The sixth entry. I saw it. The thing was sitting in a clearing staring at me. It was pale, its head round, almost bulbous. Its neck had to be over a foot long. Its eyes sunken and hollow, and its entire body stretched out and spindly almost as if its flesh didn't properly fit on its bones. The thing just stared at me, almost as if it was daring me to run. And when it stared at me, I almost felt that it was looking at me more than just my body, like it was staring into my soul. My Uncle John used to tell me stories about a creature like this, a pale, lanky monstrosity that devours these souls of its prey. He called it by two names. The first being the Nadloshi, and the second being something ridiculous like Greg, that I can't quite remember. When I asked him about the second one as a child, he told the friend of his who called it that it wanted to have a less intimidating name so it wouldn't seem so daunting. Seventh Entry It's playing with me now. As I continued along my path, I found that its tracks were going in the same direction that I had planned on traveling. Not wanting to encounter it again, I turned left, assuming that the simple change in course would be enough to avoid it. However, only a short way down my new trail, I found more of its tracks. This had gone on for several hours, no matter where I turn, or how far I always seemed to be following it. But perhaps I have misjudged the creature. As to this point, the worst thing it's done to me is steal my journal when it's clearly capable of far worse. Eighth entry. I was wrong about the creature. I came across the Ned Loshi earlier, only for it to attempt to attack me. The only reason I'm still alive is the knife that I've kept at my side this entire time. I stabbed it through the monster's hand, and it took off in the opposite direction. Strangely enough, when it was close to me, I almost thought that I could hear screaming and see a faint orange light behind its lips. Ninth Entry I'm lost. Some of my compass has gone missing from my pack and this deep into the forest, the sun is little more than a fond memory. Even worse, before I had engaged in this expedition, I had assumed that I knew of every creature within the forest. And I've recently been proved wrong yet again. I came into a clearing earlier and saw something massive moving in the distance. Its skin seemed to be dark at night. I couldn't see its full shape, but it almost looked like the top half of a person. But its eyes were haunting. They were massive, at least a foot across, and they glowed when the light hit him. Not much different to a cat and they were filled with anguish as if whatever monstrosity I saw was racked with pain. I came here in hopes that there might be a safe place for humanity, somewhere with creatures that could be hidden from or even killed. But after two days of walking, I can confirm that there is nothing here for us. Leave the forest to whatever else lives there, and run. Tenth Entry The Ned Loshi chased me into a small cave. At first I thought that was the only reason it wasn't coming after me because it thought that I might still be armed, but now I'm not so sure. It's been whispering to me for hours about how all of this has just been a game. And while at first I thought it was only trying to scare me, but now I'm starting to believe it. It's been telling me about the horrible things it's going to do to me, how it's going to dismember me and feast on my screams. And I finally realized the horrible truth of this trip. I've been doomed from the start. The only reason I'd been allowed to live for this long was that creature's desire to play with its prey. 
My only hope at this point is. The rest of the page was illegible due to blood staining it red. Now I'm sure you're wondering how I got my hands on this journal if Jack never made it out of the forest and the simple answer is, I don't know. I found his body a few weeks after you went in, or I guess I should say I found most of his body. His arms and legs had been removed. I'm no expert but it almost looked like they had been rotated until they were torn off. His stomach was covered in burns about the size of a finger almost like someone had cauterized a dozen different injuries. He didn't have his journal on him either. I just woke up one day and I found it in my book bag. Almost like someone or something had put it in there while I wasn't looking. Now we're getting back to the ocean again. The below story is not my own, but I have transcribed it as well as I possibly could. To whoever finds this notebook, my name is Riley Phillips and I was living in the US when the apocalypse happened, but I'm from Greenland. Most of my family is there and I'm determined to sail across the ocean and get home. I'm writing in this journal so that if I die, others can learn what's out there and maybe even deliver it to my family if they're still around. Day Zero I thought that this would be easy, I mean, it seemed simple enough. Gather two months worth of supplies, find a boat and sail away. Unfortunately, life can't be easy. It took me three tries to find a working boat and almost two years worth of scavenging to find enough non-perishable food for the journey. By the time I managed to get everything together, I felt like it was probably too late. But I had come this far so I might as well see it through. Day 1 I set sail today. I was originally going to use one of those old gasoline powered boats, but I managed to get lucky and find a better one, with one of those solar powered engines that were just becoming popular when the world had ended. I have found that there's shockingly little movement in the water. I had expected fish, birds, monsters, or something interesting that would be visible from the boat, but so far I've seen no signs of life other than myself. I've discovered a hidden bar fully stocked with a variety of different drinks hidden in the lower level. I may test some of them to ensure that they aren't spoiled. Day 12 I may have gone a little bit overboard with the drinks, pun intended. For the last 10 days I managed to keep myself entertained by drinking and singing sea shanties, but I was very suddenly sobered up when it started to rain. I'm not a professional sailor and I only barely know how to drive the boat that I've been on for the last week or so, but I'm fairly certain that rain is a bad sign. Hopefully it'll stop before it ever becomes an issue. Day 13 and The rain didn't stop yesterday. It faintly sprinkled all day. By the time I went to sleep, it started to drizzle a bit harder, but now it's pouring. The sound of rain pounding on the ceiling above me my whole boat shakes as waves throw it up and down. I've thrown up four times and writing is making it worse. If this is my last entry in my journal, then my boat is capsized and I've drowned. If that's the case, please tell my family that I love them. Day 16 It hasn't stopped raining for three days. By some miracle, I've managed to avoid sinking, but every few hours, I've had to take a bucket and start removing water from my room. I think I'm going to make it through this. Day 17 While I slept, the water poured into my cabin, creeping up to my knees. Unfortunately, my copy of The Shadow Over In's Mouth fell in the water while I was asleep. But luckily, I still have my hardcover copy of Stories from the Convenience Store to read. There was a lot of incomprehensible scribbling here that I couldn't decipher. Rowan. To my sister, you were the greatest sibling a person could have, and I'm sorry that I didn't get to say goodbye. To my parents, I'm sorry that I wasn't a better son. I did my best, as sad as it is. To whoever finds this journal, please find some way to get it to my family. And day 17 continued. While I was draining my cabin of water, I saw it. 
a massive shadow in the clouds, towering higher than I thought possible. I could barely make out the features of the shadow, but it seemed to be humanoid, with two giant arms ending in talons, a great bulbous head covered in spindly tendrils and two glowing red eyes staring at me from the cloud cover. I ran down the stairs and hid. So far, nothing's happened, but I don't know how long that will last. And day 18. I can't believe I'm alive. Yesterday, fear gave way to curiosity and I climbed the steps in time to find a massive green, taloned hand slamming into the water next to my boat. Everything was turned upside down as a massive wave crashed into my boat, launching me into the water. I struggled to keep my eyes open, the salty water causing a stinging pain to ring through them. At first, I thought the darkness surrounding me was just the environment, a mixture of the dark waves that I had sunk into and the fading sun. But then I saw it. A giant black serpent at least 50 feet long was spiraling through the water, slowly making its way towards me. I tried to swim away to reach the surface to escape the monster which was surrounding me, but it was no use. The creature was faster than me. I thought that I was dead when I could see its eyes. They were gigantic pools of malice that colored a shade of vibrant green that I haven't seen before or since and split down the center with a wedge of endless darkness that shone bright with the eager thoughts of feeding surging through its mind. Before I could reach the surface, it opened its mouth, revealing dozens if not hundreds of gigantic fangs. Just when it moved to consume me, the giant, taloned hand slammed into the ocean, wrapping around the serpent's head and tearing it out of the water. I watched as the creature vanished into the distance, looking tiny in the giant fist that now held it. By some luck, I found myself treading water next to my boat, once again right side up. I didn't waste any time climbing aboard, turning it around and heading back where I had come from. But before I could fully escape, something gigantic splashed into the water on my left. The head of the serpent was floating next to my ship, and it almost looked like something had taken the body off in a single bite. But I didn't bother checking, because while I watched the head, sets of glowing lights surrounding it and began stripping the flesh off. The lights followed me for a time, but eventually... As I cleared the storm, they vanished. End of journal. Usually, when I write down these stories, they end with something horrible like a death or a fate worse than that. But Riley was actually still alive, and fully human the last time that I saw him. He tells everyone that he meets of his story, and to avoid the ocean. And the only reason that I have his journal is that I traded my last copy of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein for it. He was none the worse for wear too. His only issue was that he had been having weird dreams of old gods, but I'm sure that he got over it. I'll try to write more guides in the future, but for now, I'm just trying to stay alive myself.